What's up guys, out of my analysis here, I've done my research, I'm ready to make my picks. UFC Fight Night, Luke vs Muhammad 2, not the greatest card overall, but there's still some decent fights on there man, still definitely a weekend to look forward to, and there's also Bellator on this weekend, LFA on this weekend as well. I will be covering the Bellator card uh, in a breakdown tomorrow. And I never really do this, but if you do like the content, feel free to leave a like and a subscribe. I've got an Instagram and a Discord as well, by the way. Let's just get straight into the fights. And now in the first fight of the night, we've got Haley Alating versus Kevin Kroom. Kevin Kroom came in on short notice and fought Roosevelt Roberts, submitted him in the first round. And uh, unfortunately, that did get overturned uh, for... Uh, for some reasons, and then um, he has gone on a two-fight losing streak at 145, fought Brian Kelleher on short notice and made the 145-pound weight class, but he's still very thin. He still looks uh, quite big for a 145-pounder, and now he's decided to cut down to 135, and that does um, can fill me with a little bit of concern. He's going to be massive for this weight class, though, especially in there with Haley Ting who is only 5'5 five five and isn't really like a like a strong, like a built 5'5. Five five. He's still relatively slim 5'5 five five, and Kevin Kroom is going to be 5'11 with a 73 inch reach. A decent um, a decent reach advantage over Hayley Alating here, but I am picking Hayley Alating uh, to win the fight and I do actually have a little bit of a bet on Alating myself. Maybe I'm too confident in Hayley Alating to get the win, but I do actually have him to win. Uh, Kevin Kroom fought at Bantamweight in 2014, and I do believe that he won that fight. But now that he's mid-30s, he made his debut at 155. Now he's going to be fighting at 135. I don't even know if he's going to be able to make the weight. And if he, even if he does, I think he's going to be super drained. And uh, he's not going to have the cardio to kind of keep up with Hayley Alating, who, um, to be fair, hasn't looked incredible in the last couple of fights. But he did have... That uh, very controversial win over Ryan Benoit. He did beat Dinar Bakaray, which doesn't really look as amazing as it did. But um, you know what? Like he showed a chin against Casey Kenny, who beat the who beat him up a lot. And then uh, the the Gustavo Lopez fight only six months ago. I think Haley Alating's going to get the job done. I think that he's going to have to utilize some wrestling here. Kevin Krug does have wrestling himself, but I think Haley Alating, he's going to have to close the distance. He's got such a reach disadvantage, and I do think that he's going to be able to get inside. He's going to be able to wear on Kevin Krug. He's not going to have the greatest cardio from this massive weight cut that I'm assuming he's going to have to do here. And I'm um, picking Haley Alating to win a decision. I think he's got power, but I don't think Haley Alating has the power to knock out Kevin Kroom. But maybe the weight cut does hurt the chin. But I don't think it does. I think he'll be going with Haley Alating by a decision here. So does the majority of Tapology voters, to my uh, surprise, actually. I've seen a lot of people picking Kroom, but I'm picking Haley Alating to win the fight here. And the next fight is Sam Hughes versus Estella Nunes. I am picking Estella Nunes to win this fight. But it's definitely like worth noting that this is a winnable fight for Sam Hughes. She is an underdog and I don't expect her to win. But Sam Hughes potentially could find some success here. Because Estella Nunes really does only have a good stand-up base. She doesn't have the greatest ground game really. But she does have a very good Muay Thai base. Which is why I'm kind of opening this up here. She's a two-time world champion. And uh, Muay Thai 54 fights, 50 wins. So he's got a great Muay Thai background, but I think that if Sam Hughes really wanted to win this fight, she would have to lean on some wrestling. Because Estella Nunes, she looked good on the feet, definitely against Ariana Canalusi, but she doesn't have the greatest defensive grappling. And uh, Sam Nunes, has, has, um, she does have some sort of wrestling game, and if she really wants to win, she's going to have to pressure Estella Nunes to try and get... Uh, her to the ground. That's the way that Sam Nunes wins. Sam, Sam Hughes, sorry, wins the fight. But Alastella Nunes, if she keeps the fight on the feet, I'm really expecting her to put on a striking clinic over Sam Hughes and a potential TKO. Um, but yeah, I'm picking Alastella Nunes. Sam Hughes, she got called up to the UFC, but she's kind of shown, unfortunately for her, she's kind of proven that she may not be quite the level of the UFC competition that we already have. Like she lost to Loma Lukbunmi, who was a decent prospect in her own right. She lost to Luana Poneo who was also a great prospect, but she got uh, TKO'd by Tisha Torres, who was in that top 15 at the moment. So, um, yeah, as for this fight, though, I think Estella Nunes, she's a weird fighter. She fought, she took, like, a decent time off between the one fight and the UFC fight, and essentially, I found out because USADA uh, pinged her for something there, so she had to take three years off, but she's not 30 years old yet. She still, still does have time to get a couple of good wins in the UFC. I think it probably does start with Sam Hughes. Sam Hughes could find success with the wrestling, but Stella Nunes with a striking background, I'm going to trust that. I'm going to go Stella Nunes by decision or a TKO. Sam Hughes, though, I mean, if she really wants to win, she's going to have to use a ground-based uh, sort of, uh, sort of um, a gameplay. She's really going to have to go for the takedowns. Ignore my computer deciding to just completely freeze itself. And, um, yeah, that's it. I'm picking uh, Stella Nunes by decision. 
The next fight I'm going to be looking at is Trey Ogden versus Jordan Levitt. I've been all over Jordan Levitt as soon as the fight was announced. I found out that when the odds come out, Jordan Levitt was the underdog. And it's gotten me pretty excited, man. Uh, Jordan Levitt, I do think, actually has the better ground game than Trey Ogden. Trey Ogden, yes, he's got a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. But of his four losses, three of them are by submission. And all three of those submission losses are in the first round. He's been submitted by the same guy twice, which is Thomas Gifford. And Thomas Gifford actually does have a great ground game. I think he's got like 20 wins now and 13 of them are by submission. So can kind of respect that there. But then he did get submitted by Nick Brown. And uh, since then, like he fought this guy, Cody Carrillo. And Cody Carrillo, uh, 15 and 18 record. And he, he gave Trey Ogden like, some problems. like not, not a lot of resistance, but some resistance in that fight. And that scares me, man. So that's why I'm going with Jordan Levitt. I do think Jordan Levitt's got a great ground game, even if it is taken down and he's on his back. He can find submissions from anywhere. He's got that inverted uh, triangle choke only three months ago against Matt Sales. When Matt Sales was talking a pretty big game uh, prior to that fight, he did uh, lose to Claudio Poilers, but Claudio Poilers is a decent prospect himself. And, um, yeah, like, as I've been saying, like a submission win on this contender series, and he KO'd uh, Matt Wyman with that slam about like 40 seconds into the first round. Trey Ogden making his UFC debut. He's an older guy. The wins on his record aren't as great. He's been a lot less active than Jordan Levitt as well. Jordan Levitt has fought five times in about a year and a half. So he's been very active. He's fighting all the time. Win or lose. I'm going for majority here. Jordan Levitt by submission. I know there's Ogden submission guys out there, but... Nah, man. I'm going Jordan Levitt by submission. I do think he's going to get the job done. Sorry. Trey Ogden has shown that he can get submitted in the past. And he has shown that he can get submitted in the past by uh, lesser grapplers, in my personal opinion, than Jordan Levitt. Jordan Levitt by submission, probably in the first round, in my opinion. Alright, so we can move on to Chris Barnett versus Martin Budai. Uh, from what I've learned a little bit more after watching a decent amount of tape on these guys, is that Chris Barnett does not really look too great when he's under pressure. A classic example was actually when he was on the back foot against Ben Rothwell in that fight when Ben Rothwell, who isn't in the UFC anymore unfortunately, I'm waiting to find out why, um, he didn't look as amazing as he usually does. Like when he was fighting John Vellante and they were in the open space, that's when he landed that wheel kick. <laughs> oh man, I love that KO. I love um I love Chris Barnett, man. He's five foot nine in the heavyweight division. How can you not love this guy? But Martin Boudet, Martin Boudet does have a decent sort of uh he's got a decent um fighting style to combat Chris Barnett if that makes sense. Martin Brude is a very pressure forward guy. He's six foot four. He does clinch up against the cage a lot. I don't really know how that's gonna work, considering Chris Barnett is only five foot nine compared to the six foot four that is Martin Boudé. But um no Martin Boudet, he does like to walk forward, he does like to be the pressure forward guy. I do think that his size advantage and his ability to push um, Chris Barnett up against the cage probably will make Chris Barnett walk backwards and not really in his most comfortable zone on the feet where he can throw his spinning kicks, where he can throw his weird unorthodox techniques that he does do. And he does do often. He did it on the regional scene a lot. And uh, he did it um, only four months ago against Gian Vellante. But I do think that Martin Boudet is going to win this fight. He won his uh, fight against Lorenzo Hood with a knee to the head. Chris Barnett's only 5'9". Martin Boudet is only 6'4". Six, six I think Martin Boudet is probably going to be able to knee Chris Barnett in the head. He's a lot bigger. A lot, lot bigger, actually. He's going to be pushing forward. He's going to be walking forward. He has fought good uh, competition. Not really, actually, sorry. He's one guy in the... Uh, on, and he was losing that fight against uh, as well against Camille Minder until he knocked him out. But, um, yeah, I think Martin Boudet. I think that he's going to be able to beat Chris Barnett in this one. I'm actually more leaning the decision side. Just a more precious, heavy... Uh, sort of game plan, potentially even taking Barnett to the floor, but I think more just working his way uh, in the in the clinch and uh, a lot of control time. Maybe Barnett could catch him with a KO. Maybe Bardet Boudet could catch him with a KO. Uh, I'm personally not going to bet like an over or under on this fight because I think a lot of people are predicting the fight to not go the distance. But I will be going Martin Boudet. I think Martin Boudet a decision is is, is probably a fair pick. But um, Chris Barnett's pretty live as a dog. But I love Chris Barnett. I hope he stays in the UFC for a very long time because he's a very exciting fighter. But I will be picking Boudet to win the fight. All right, if we move into the next one, we've got Huffa Garcia versus Jesse Ronson. Huffa Garcia, I believe he is two and no, sorry, one and two in the UFC. I went zero and two against Nasrat Hakpras and Chris Grutishmaka, and then he beat Natan Levy, who's a decent karate-based uh, sort of uh, prospect in his last fight there. And one thing that I have been quite impressed with Huffa Garcia is he has been fighting pretty often. He fought four months ago, and then he, uh, between that, he took a four-month layoff. 
and then about a four month layoff in between the the Nasser Hak Price fight and the the Chris Grudismacher fight. The loss to Chris Grudismacher, I mean it's not the greatest loss to have in your record to be honest. He's fighting Jesse Ronson. Jesse Ronson came back on uh, short notice about a year and a half ago to uh, Nicholas Dolby and was a massive underdog. He did end up winning that fight but it has been uh, overturned due to um, a tainted supplement is what um, Jesse Ronson has called it. But if you guys don't know, uh, now you know. Jesse Ronson has actually been on a run in the UFC back in 2014. So he's been in the game for a long time. And that UFC run, man, was a pretty, pretty unlucky, man. Split decision to a loss to Mikel Palazio, split decision loss to Francisco Trinaldo, and also split decision loss to Kevin Lee. So three split decision losses to three decent fighters. Um, that's pretty uh, respectable, man, but he still got cut anyway, unfortunately. Went on a little win streak and then lost a few, won a few again, and then he, he then he lost a couple. Beat Troy Lampson, and then he stepped up on short notice to fight Nicholas Dalby here. Now he's fighting Huffa Garcia. The fight is not taking place at 170 as uh, Tapology has decided to confuse us all with. That is taking place at 155. So now a 36 year old Jesse Ronson is going to have to cut even more weight to make the lightweight limit. And I'm going to trust Huffa Garcia. Huffa Garcia, he's got like a boxing, uh, wrestling sort of uh, background. I guess you could still call him like a boxer wrestler if you're going to call him anything. He's got a good boxing game and he's also got a wrestling game as well if he wants to go to it. Jesse Ronson on the other hand, he's pretty good. He does have a good submission game as well. And he is going to be a lot longer and taller than uh, Rafa Garcia here with a reach advantage. And also a height advantage as well. But his two losses recently were in the UFC. One of them to a Nikolai Alexation and Natan Schult who is uh, actually very good. But um... Yeah, I'm going to be picking Huff Garcia to win this one. I think uh, Jesse Ronson, he hasn't been uh, improving recently. I think that we have been seeing improvements from Huff Garcia, especially in his last fight. I do think that we're going to keep seeing this guy improve as a 27-year-old that is fighting as often as he is. Jesse Ronson taking a layoff, and uh, before that, he was uh, fighting relatively often himself. But he's 36 years old now, and I don't really know if we're going to see any improvements uh, as a 36-year-old. I'm picking Huffa Garcia to win a decision here, using that boxing and wrestling sort of style to uh, close the distance. Maybe even get some takedowns as well against Jesse Ronson himself, and uh, just win a decision for Huffa Garcia here. And the next fight, man, it's very interesting. We've got Drakkar Close making his return after losing to Benil Badariush, and then... Uh, he does have the win against Bobby Green, which is very controversial, very controversial, which has aged pretty well, uh, I guess you could say. And Brandon Jenkins, man, took a fight on short notice against Zhu Rong. It was only a few days notice, actually, and he did get TKO'd. And now that we uh, kind of think about it, Zhu Rong, unfortunately, just isn't as good as a lot of us thought originally. So, um, that loss hasn't aged very well whatsoever in that six months span, but he is training in a syndicate MMA. He is training with good guys, and he is actually a pretty good prospect uh, in a way. But I don't think that he's UFC level um, at the moment. He really hasn't proved himself to be UFC level. He beat Jacob Kilburn by a switch flying knee, which is very telegraphed. I'm very surprised Jacob Kilburn didn't see it coming. And um, before that, though, I mean, he's beating good enough guys on the on the regional scene, but he is losing to Mike Breeden. And Mike Breeden's in the UFC, and he's another guy which a lot of people aren't thinking that he is UFC level himself. Drakkar Close how, hasn't fought for two years. He's had a lot of problems, man. He's had injuries, and then he was meant to fight Jeremy Stevens. Then he had that uh, concussion against uh, Jeremy Stevens at the weigh-in. And now uh, he's fighting Brandon Jenkins. And it's worth noting that Brandon Jenkins is going to be a lot bigger than him. He's six foot tall. Uh, in the uh, in the lightweight division with a with a little reach advantage as well, which people would potentially utilize. But I just think that Drakkar Close is levels above this guy, man. Drakkar Close on his best days is probably like a, a top 15 fighter. Or in fact, he probably was like a top 15 fighter um, in his prime. But um, that Benil Darius loss hasn't actually um, aged too badly. But Benil Darius could be fighting for a title with one or two more wins. Christos Giagos is very well rounded. Bobby Green is now looking um, on the outside of the top 15 in right now. Lando Venato as well was still regarded as a decent sort of prospect. He always brings a good fight. And the David Tamer, I don't really know what um, I, old mate David Tamer is up to, but he's the better of the two Tamer brothers. I do know for that for a fact. What is David Tamer? I'm very, very um, off track here. I, like, I'm just trying to remember, like, have I seen him in the UFC recently? I haven't. That's right. That makes sense. He lost to Charles Oliveira. You know. Okay. Anyway, um, got very off track. I think Drakkar Close, man. I do think he's going to get the job done. I think he's going to beat Brandon Jenkins. Probably a decision here. I think he's just a lot, lot more well-rounded, and just a little bit better as a fighter. I feel like Brandon Jenkins' only way to win the fight 
is by knockout. He's a massive underdog here, but you can't really um, count him out because Tricard Close, he hasn't fought for two years. He's had a lot of injuries. We don't know how he's going to return. Brandon Jenkins is fighting out of Syndicate MMA, so he does have a lot of good training partners there. He could be live for like a round one KO while Drakkar Close is still kind of building into the fight. But that's his only chance of winning in my opinion. Apart from that, I think Drakkar Close is going to close the distance and land his shots. And um, just kind of do what he wants to do in the fight. I think Drakkar Close will win. Brandon Jenkins potentially a live dog, but he's really not. Um, I'm going Drakkar Close, man. Alright, this next one, we've got Lena Landsberg versus Penny Kiantad. Lena Landsberg hasn't fought for two years. I don't think that this is going to be a very long uh, prediction whatsoever. But in my opinion, though, that loss to Penny Kiantad against Raquel Pennington hasn't actually aged too badly. Raquel Pennington's on a decent win streak herself. She actually just most recently lost, uh, sorry, won last weekend over Aspen Ladd. But a lot of people still kind of think there's a decent prospect in a way. Penny Kiantad, her full fight win streak was over to um, older fighters like Alexis Davids, Jara Eubanks. Uh, Bitch Kahea and Jessica Rose Clark, who I guess isn't old, but is still kind of like at the bottom of the division. But she was on a win streak at one point, she still is ranked. And uh, Lena Landsberg, she does have good, um, I guess she's got good wrestling and ground and pound, but she hasn't fought for two years. She lost to Sarah McMahon. Uh, she has beaten Macy Kiasson, who I guess is like still a decent enough prospect herself. Tonya Evinger, like who really knows who that is anymore? Like she's an older girl. Yana Kunitsky, she lost to. I guess that's not really a bad loss either. But, um,. You know, like, a lot of these, like, fights that she's had were so long ago. How are we meant to know what Lena Landsberg is going to look now? She's 40 years old. Penny Kianzad is, uh, is only 30 years old. I mean, there's a 10-year gap in between these two fighters. And it's not like it's a 20-year-old fighting a 30-year-old. This is a 30-year-old fighting a 40-year-old in the women's bantamweight division. I just don't really see a path to victory for Lena Landsberg. I think Penny Kianzad is going to be better on the feet. I think that the fight is going to take place on the feet. I think she's just going to be faster. She's going to be able to make the read. She's going to be able to land uh, more herself. And I think she's just going to out-volume Lena Valansberg to, to a win here with a, with a volume strike. And I think Penny Kianzad is going to win this fight here, in my opinion. This next one that I'm looking at is Devin Clark versus William Knight. I will be picking William Knight to win as the underdog in this one here, and I'm actually a little bit surprised that he's the dog, considering Topology does actually have him slanted to win with a decent amount here. Devin Clark, one thing I completely forgot about, I don't know why it completely went over my head in the in the early predictions. He fought Eon Kutalaba six months ago, and Eon Kutalaba rearranged his jaw in a way. Like, man, that... That, that injury is nasty, man. I, I don't like the injury whatsoever for Devin Clark. I don't like the fact that he's making a six-month turnaround from that fight. I don't know how long like it takes for normally recover from a jaw. Like, I don't know if you guys know, but I actually have had a pretty major jaw surgery myself. In fact, um, half of my jaw is actually bone from my leg. And I don't know if you can see in the little camera, but I've actually got a scar that goes from the middle of my chin all the way to the back of my neck and it took a lot lot that took a long time to recover man like um i was in the hospital for a while man Devin clark is fighting six months later like bro i don't even go to sparring uh, um and uh man nah, i just i'm scared man Devin clark um i'm scared about the jaw injury against a power puncher like william knight i feel like Devin clark like i know he's a savage i know he went back out there for the third round and i know he got beaten up pretty bad by eon but still kept on fighting but William Knight's a power puncher, man. And I know that they like Devin Clark's a savage, but you gotta tell me something, man. Like, how can he um not have that in the back of his mind? I've got this jaw injury. I can't get hit clean in the jaw. I don't want to get hit clean in the jaw. Also worth noting, the fight's taking place at heavyweight, which I think will benefit William Knight, considering William Knight just doesn't seem to want to cut weight whatsoever since he weighed in at 218 pounds against Maxime Grisham, which he lost, but like 218 pounds, like bro, what's he gonna weigh in at? Like probably 230 pounds. William Knight is not a small dude. He's five foot ten in the heavyweight division now. Um, he should fight Chris Barnett after this for sure, but I'm picking William Knight to win by KO. Devin Clark is good, and he does have good losses on his record. I know like good losses is a pretty bad term to use, but he lost to Ion Kutalaba, I believe is top 15 now. He lost to Anthony Smith, who was like potentially going to be fighting for a title within the next 12 months if he wins a couple of fights. Oh, Alonso Winningfield win, which um, Knight has also won. And he lost to Ryan Spann as well. I don't know if Ryan Spann is in the top 15 anymore, but he is still kind of seen as like some sort of prospect. 
William Knight. I'm going to pick William Knight to win by KO. Uh, short notice for both guys. William Knight obviously doesn't want to cut the weight. And uh, they both obviously don't want to cut the weight. So they're both fighting at heavyweight. Interested to see what they weigh in it. I think William Knight will be heavier. And I think that William Knight's going to carry that power up to the heavyweight division. I'm picking William Knight to win by KO. I think Devin Clark is going to be wary of that jaw injury that he had against Iron Kutalaba. And we're going to see William Knight win by KO. So that's going to be pretty crazy, man. Alright, this next one, Pat Sabatini. A lot of people were locking up Pat Sabatini. I've seen a lot of people putting him in parlays. I've seen a lot of people beating him by uh, submission or, or inside the distance. I agree. I think Pat Sabatini is a big favourite and he's a big favourite for a reason. And I do think that he is going to beat TJ Laramie in this one here. TJ Laramie, I watched his last fight against Derek Minna for as long as it lasted. And he dove into a, he dove into a guillotine. They don't really show too much awareness. I mean, this was a year six months ago, so he probably has made an um, improvement since then. But he dove into a guillotine. They don't really show too much awareness that he was in the guillotine and he got submitted. And now he's fighting a guy with the ground game of Pat Sabatini. I know that these fight two weren't matched up to fight originally. I think Pat Sabatini was meant to fight like Tucker Lutz or something, and TJ Laramie was meant to fight someone else. But now they're fighting each other, and this is just not a good matchup for TJ Laramie, man. He's very, he's like a shorter guy for 145. And uh, he's five foot six. He's a he's a short guy. He's pretty stocky, and he does have power in the hands. And this is his only chance of winning the fight, in my opinion. He needs to hurt Pat Sabatini. What happened was Jamal Emmers actually knocked down Pat Sabatini, and then went for like his own heel hook sub submission. But uh, Pat Sabatini does just have a good enough uh, ground game to. Uh, know how to get the heel hook in those 50-50 positions. Pat Sabatini, great ground game. I think he's going to win by submission. Let me confirm. Uh, yes, so he was, sorry, he wasn't meant to fight Tucker Lutz. He was meant to fight Gavin Tucker. And TJ Laramie was meant to be fighting uh, Malsik Bagdasarian. That would have been a pretty good fight. But uh, unfortunately, we're not getting it. Pat Sabatini by submission all day, in my opinion. Uh, Laramie, I just don't think, is um, aware enough on the ground to, uh, to win this fight. And I think that Pat Sabatini, as soon as he does get the fight to the ground, it's going to be in his world, and I think he's going to get a submission in the first or the second round. I'm going Sabatini by submission. I do have him in a parlay, or a more like a two-legger, just to kind of boost up the odds of my bet on Hayley Alating, which I'm kind of thinking might be a bit of a dodgy bet, but I've still beat Hayley Alating and Pat Sabatini, so that's my, my two-league. I'm not going to really recommend you guys follow on with it, because I feel like there's definitely better bets to be made, but I am saying Sabatini should be a lock, if a lock even exists in MMA. He should be a very confident pick. He's a lot bigger than TJ Laramie as well, which will, which will count uh, in the ground exchanges too. So yeah, Pat Sabatini by submission all day in my opinion. Alright, this next one is Mayra Bueno Silva versus Yanan Wu. Um, to be fair, not really 100% sure why this is so high up on the main card. But it is what it is, man. Um, Mayra Bueno Silva moving up from the 125 pound division after having some mixed results, up and downs, I guess. And Yanan Wu is a 1-3 and three in the UFC, unfortunately for her. She hasn't been super active. She lost to Gina Mazzani in her debut, beat Lauren Mueller by submission, but then lost to Mizuki Inui and Jocelyn Edwards a year and two months ago. She has not been active. There's a year and five month gap between those two fights and a year and two month gap um, in this fight here. She is only 25 years old, not even 26 yet, so even if she does lose this fight, she probably will um, make some improvements and probably will build up the record even more. But I do think that Mayra Buena Silva is going to win this fight. She's an absolutely huge favorite here. And um, to be fair, I think... I kind of agree, but I think minus 400 is, is a bit heavy, man. It's a bit heavy. Like, you know, we're maybe 1-3 in the UFC, but she's still kind of alive. She's going to be bigger than Mayra, considering Mayra is moving up the division, maybe in the first fight that um, she's moving up the division. She hasn't quite full filled out into the bantamweight frame yet. Maybe she's still got a little bit more, I guess, like weight to put on, a little bit more muscle to put on before she is a true 135 pounder. But um, I'm still picking Mayra Bueno Silva. I think she's just going to be faster than Yanan Wu on the feet. I think she's actually pretty good on the ground as well. But she does have a good Muay Thai style. And um, she does have some finishes in her record as well. Five of them by submission. I think Mayra Bueno Silva could get the job done by submission here. Seven, five out of seven wins by submission. But I'm more on the uh, the side of the decision. I think Bueno Silva is just going to be a little bit better than Yanan Wu. Kind of a, like everywhere. And then uh, she'll win the fight that way there. So I'm picking Mayra Bueno Silva to win the fight. Um, and she fights out of shooter box, actually. So it's definitely worth noting that shooter box fighters are very, very aggressive. And Mayra Bueno Silva is probably going to be very ex aggressive over Yana and Wu in this one. I'm picking her to win the fight. Decision. 
Alright, the next fight, man, we've got Andre Fialho versus Miguel Valleza. And this has got banger written all over it, man. I've been on Andre Fialho the whole time. It, um, as the videos of other recappers have been coming out, as you guys know, I do my early prediction. So I look at the card before um, I do any research and I kind of make my early leans. I was on Andre Fialho then and I'm still on Andre Fialho now. I'm picking him to win as the underdog here. And Andre Fialho, as I said, man, in that early recap video or early look video, my man Andre has truly been um, on a crazy win streak before he ran into Mikel Pajaya on like four days notice. He knocked out Stefan Sikulik in the first round, knocked out Lincoln Puig in the first round, knocked out Sung Hoon Yu in the first round, and he knocked out the man himself, James Vick, in the second round at um, XMMA 1 where he was actually headlining that card. XMMA is a pretty good underground promotion in my opinion. But um, now let's talk about it, bro. I think that uh, Andre Fialho is going to bring it to Miguel Boyeza. Miguel Boyeza in his last couple of fights, yes, he's lost. So it seems like maybe a lot of people kind of jumping off the hype train. I did pick Miguel Boyeza to win against Santiago Pontanibio, but I picked him to lose against Chaos Williams. And I'm picking him to lose against Andre Fialho here. Um, yeah, he's losing, but what he's doing is he's showing pretty bad striking defense. And Andre Fialho has pretty good striking defense. He's got definitely a lot better striking defense than Miguel Baeza. And Andre Fialho won that first round pretty convincingly against Miguel Bahia on very short notice on a pay-per-view card where there's a big crowd in attendance. So his nerves would have been running high. And he's fighting a guy that is borderline top 15 in the in whilst weight division right now. And uh, he looked good. He looked good in the first round. He did gas, but that's because he took the fight in like four days notice, man. Miguel Baeza, I think that he's getting hit a lot. Um, I know he lasted to the third round against Chaos Williams, who is a savage, and um, Santiago Ponzinibbio is also a savage, but what I'm trying to say, man, is Andre Fiojo, if Andre Fiojo touches Miguel Baeza on the chin a couple of times clean, he's going out. He had five KOs in 2021, four of them in the first round, one of them over the man with no chin, James Vick. Like, this is a pretty crazy, um, a crazy fight, and I'm, I'm, I'm on the dog, man. I think Andre Fiojo on the feet, all he really does have is the boxing. He does have a ground game if it really needs to come to it, but I would give the ground game to Miguel Baeza, who does actually have some jiu-jitsu uh, if it needs to be there. But two big gyms fighting each other, Sanford MMA and MMA Masters. Going to be a great fight. I think Miguel Baeza is going to have like a good kicking, good kickboxing advantage. Andre Fiojo, though, great boxing. I think he's going to pressure Miguel Baeza. Miguel Baeza is going to take a few shots on the chin and I'm going to be picking Andre Fiojo to a land uh, pretty clean on Baeza and knock him out. I'm going Andre Fiojo by KO in this fight here as the underdog and I do think he's going to get the job done inside the distance. Andre Fiojo is my pick. Alright, this next fight, man. Kyle Barajo versus Gadzi. I'm a Gadzi. I've looked into the fight. 50-50 fight for sure. The odds are kind of saying it too. Like we've got Gadzi on Gadzi versus minus 140. I think that's a pretty fair line on Kyle Barajo returning barely plus money. Um, if you're wanting to lay down on him personally, I wouldn't lay down on this fight um, whatsoever. I don't think there's any real bet that on this fight that makes sense unless you're going dog or pass. But even then, you're not going to get the craziest return out of Kyle Barajo. Who might be my pick. I'm still 50-50 on the fight. I know I'm at the breakdown video. But I'm really unsure. I will give you guys an, a slight lean at the end. You know what? I'm going to give you guys a slight lean right now. My slight lean is actually Kyle Brauho. Um, I like this guy's jujitsu skill set. Kyle Brauho. He has trained with Damian Wyatt in the past. In fact, I can probably prove it right now. Um, Kyle Brauho. Damian Wyatt. Here we go. Uh, he has trained with Damian Wyatt in the past. And... Um, He's got a great ground game. He's also been in there with um, the madman that is Jelson Almeida. Shout out to the MMA guru for pointing that one out to me. And he made it to decision with Jelson Almeida in a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu match. And Jelson Almeida is going to make waves in the light heavyweight division. I'm telling you that for a fact. He also did impress me with his, um, like I guess, his like work ethic, quote unquote, in the Dana White's Contender Series fight. He beat Aaron Jeffrey by a decision. And then he only returned, like, um,. Like a three weeks later, I think it was. Um, yeah, three weeks later to, to fight Jesse Murray at 205 pounds. He beat um, 
Aaron Jeffries, the underdog as well in Dana White's Contender Series, returned three weeks later to fight Jesse Murray. At 205 pounds, he won that fight, and then uh, in the first round as well, and Dana White was like, you know what, like, you've won two fights in Dana White's Contender Series in a row. We'll give you the contract. Now that he's had the contract, he has had a couple of fights fall out, and now he's going to be fighting Gadziem Gadziev, who hasn't fought uh, for five months himself, and he did win Dana White's Contender Series uh, 2021 against Yancey Silva, who is a Muay Thai guy. But Yancey Silva is only a Muay Thai guy. Yancey Silva had no ground game whatsoever, so Gadziel Magadziev was easily able to get that submission win. Before that, he was fighting relatively okay levels of competition uh, on the regional scene himself. But what he's been doing is he takes his guys to the ground, and he's kind of slow on the ground, but he does put a lot of pressure when he's on the ground. So here we go. Damian Mayan, Kalbraha, teacher, knee bar defense, ending on a, a kata gatagami. I don't really know Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu terms, but I, what this tells me... Kaio Barajo and Damian Maia do train together or have trained together in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu in the past. So that tells me that Kaio Barajo, I mean, he does have a great ground game. I mean, he went to a decision in a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu fight with uh, Jelton Almeida. But, um, yeah, as for um, uh, Gatsio Magadziev, the level of competition is actually quite impressive. Uh, to be fair, he's been a 7-0 guy, 7-1 guy on the contender series there. 17-18, and 9-2. and two. I mean, like, it's pretty hard to not uh, pick... Uh, Gutsy on Gutsy of here, but I feel like styles make fights. And Kyle Barajo, he's got a very awkward karate stance on the feet. I feel like he could potentially pose uh, some problems to Gutsy on Gutsy, who does have good stand up himself. But uh, you know what? Like, I really do kind of like the dog here. I like Kyle Barajo. I like Kyle Barajo's, um, I like his attitude. I like the fact that he is willing to fight twice on Dana White's Contender Series. He really wants this, guys. He really wants to be in the UFC, and I feel like the guy that wants it more in a matchup so close like this potentially could be the guy getting the win. I feel like Kyle Barajo is a guy that's going to want to win the UFC debut uh, more than Gadzi Omagadziev, in my opinion. I'm going Kyle Barajo. I think he's going to lock up a submission, but I, um, I would not be surprised whatsoever if Omagadziev got the win. So don't really, like, quote me too hard on this, guys, because I like, don't come back and, like, give me heaps of hate, because I'm not saying Kyle is a lock whatsoever, man. In fact, Gadziel Magadziev, if I was making fantasy odds myself, I would put Gadziel Magadziev as a very slight favorite, and Kyle Barajo is a very slight underdog, but I am still picking the guy that I would consider the dog, man. I'm picking Kyle Barajo. I think he's the dog that's going to fight for your money, but and then again, I don't really recommend playing money on this fight. Kyle Barajo... He's a dog, though. He's a dog, and he's coming to fight, and I will be picking the dog in Barajo to win this fight here. It's a great fight, and I really cannot wait for it. All right, moving on to the main event, Vicente Luque versus Bilal Muhammad. This is going to be my second time recording it because I got so off-topic. It's unbelievable. But Vicente Luque, man, he only fought um, eight months ago against Michael Chiesa. I feel like he's taking that long of a break uh, because uh, I believe that he was thinking that he could be fighting Nate Diaz because in the build-up to the Michael Chiesa fight in the, in the press conference, there was a question about Nate Diaz, and uh, he said that he wanted to fight Nate Diaz, and then Nate Diaz said that he wanted to fight him. So maybe Luke was waiting for a Nate Diaz fight the whole time, or maybe he was waiting for a top uh, contender fight the whole time. I don't really know, but I thought I'd just mention that. Bilal Muhammad, on the other hand, he kind of um, got that no contest to Leon Edwards where in a fight that she was losing in my opinion, and then he came back, like, you do you do the UFC a favor, the UFC day you a favor, he fought a highly ranked, at the time, Damian Meyer, and then a highly ranked at the time, Stephen Thompson, to get his ranking pretty high in the welterweight division, and now he's fighting Vicente Luque, and um, potentially, like, a title eliminator, or, like, the winner of this fight is going to fight someone else for a title eliminator, I feel like Vicente Luque versus Kamzat Shemaev would be, like, one of the most insane fights ever, if it was to ever happen. But, um, yeah, Vicente Luque, he's got the reach advantage. He's knocked out Bilal Muhammad in the past, in 2016. And I feel like this is kind of like, um, going to be in the back of Bilal Muhammad's mind. Bilal got knocked out within about two minutes in um, the first fight in 2016. I think that's always going to play in the back of Bilal's mind when they're fighting. This guy knocked me out. This guy knocked me out. I can't do this because he, he's got the power. But Luke is also showing a decent ground game recently. He's got a pretty nasty dash choke. He put one on Tyron Woodley, and he also put one on Michael Chiesa as well. And Michael Chiesa was actually showing like an improved stand-up game, to be fair. But, um, yeah, man, Vicente Luque, very much well-known for his KO power. I think, like, 11 wins by KO, 9 wins by submission, so he's very well-rounded. He's a finisher on the on the ground, and he's a finisher on the feet. Bilal Muhammad is a finisher nowhere because he's got 15 wins by decision. 
But um, yeah, I feel like Vicente Luque inside the distance. I'm going. I'm riding Vicente Luque by KO. I feel like there is a striking uh, difference here. I feel like there's a big power difference for sure. But Lal Muhammad really hasn't proven that he's got the hands to knock someone out cold on the feet in the UFC. Like 15 decision wins. Like he's not really the biggest finisher in the world. He's pretty happy taking the fights to the scorecards. Vicente Luque is not. He has two decision wins in his UFC career. So he's UFC, two decision wins in his entire career. And he's also got the win over Tiago Santos as well. Um, hold on, let me... Yeah, I forgot about that. Vicente Luque, he's actually beaten Tiago Santos. Or maybe it's Tiago Santos has beaten Vicente Luque. No, he beat Tiago Santos in 2012. And yes, this is the same guy. Um, that is fighting at 205 pounds right now. So, um, yeah, definitely worth like noting that, I guess. But uh, I thought that would be a fun fact. Um, in case you're at like the pub with your mates... And you want to say, you know what? You guys know Tiago Santos, who's fighting at 205 pounds right now? Vicente Luque has beat him, that guy, and he beat him in 2012. Anyway, Vicente Luque KO is my pick. Uh, by KO or submission. Actually, you can find the, the Vicente Luque versus Tiago Santos fight on my YouTube channel. It's one of my shorts. Vicente Luque KO, going with the majority here. I feel like a lot of people want Vicente Luque to win just because he's so exciting. I feel like if he does win, he probably will call out Nate Diaz again, but I don't think he should. I think he should call out Kamzat Shumayev. So we can have one of the most insane fights of all time. Vicente Luque versus uh, Kamzat Shumayev would be ridiculous. Or even Gilbert Burns maybe, I don't know. But um, either way, Vicente Luque is my pick.